Hi, everyone. Welcome to another book discussion with Ann Arbor District Library and the Unerased Book Club. We are very excited to be here tonight with the facilitators from the Unerased Book Club to talk about a thriller, uh, My Sweet Girl, and this is by Amanda J. Atisa. And this will be a really fun discussion for us. Uh, before we get started, maybe we can go around and introduce ourselves and give a brief visual description as well. So I'll start. I'm Lucy. I work at Ann Arbor District Library I'm in the youth department, but I also do a lot of adult events, a lot of events around books, which makes me very happy. Um, I am sitting in front of a wall with watercolor paintings. I am a white 50 year old woman with shoulder length brown hair and I'm wearing a gray and yellow scarf because I'm very cold. I'm Emily. Uh, I am a librarian here at the Ann Arbor District Library. I purchase and select books for kids, kids fiction, uh, but most of the events I do are for adults and for seniors. I am sitting in a conference room, so I've got a white wall behind me and a phone. I am a white woman in my mid-30s with longish red hair and two braids, and I am also wearing a sweater because it is chilly, greenish one. And my name is Jacob. I am also an Ann Arbor District Library employee where I work in the outreach department. Um, I am a 29 year old white male with short blonde hair. I'm sitting in my dimly lit apartment and I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to jump in then. <clears throat> Pardon me. My name's Beth. I'm also on the outreach team at AADL. Um, and uh, I've been there 15 years. I am a 61 year old white woman um, who admittedly looks a little younger than that. But anyway, um, uh, so curly, dark hair, glasses uh, that are slightly tinted. I've got two windows behind me and I just wrapped my AADL blanket around me because it's chilly in my house too. <clears throat> Hi folks, I'm Fatima. I am one of the co-facilitators of Unerased Book Club. I am a brown woman in my mid-30s. I have long black hair. I'm also wearing a scarf because I'm getting over a cold and trying to keep my throat warm. And I have a digital background of a scene from a Chittagong balcony behind me. And hey everyone, my name is Sheila. I'm the founder and a co-facilitator of Unraced Book Club. Um, I'm a brown woman in my early 30s with medium length hair and a background of um, Adam's Peak, which is the highest point in Sri Lanka, which seems very fitting for this conversation. And um, to give a little bit of context of the book that we're reading, My Sweet Girl by Amanda Jayapissa is a thriller, like Lucy said, but the plot of the book is um, about a woman named Paloma uh, who is a Sri Lankan adoptee into a white family in the Bay Area, um, who is dealing with um, harboring a dark secret and the implications of that. And the way that the book is structured is it goes uh, between present time and um, her uh, at the months leading up to her leaving the orphanage in Sri Lanka um, before she's adopted. And uh, the book really uh, focus, uh, really uh, harbors on a Un, uh, unpredictable, unpredictable or unreliable narrator. So that's really what we're working with here. And um, like we like to, as we like to start any book club, we wanted to ask, how did people feel about this book? So we'll open it up. I absolutely loved it. Uh, I'll admit that thrillers are like candy for me, but I only recently learned that there are well-written thrillers and this one definitely falls under it. Uh, I listened to it on audio and the narrator was fabulous. And I think it really helped with the dual time timelines of the book um, and helped with keeping characters uh, straight. Not that there are terribly many characters in this, but I never at any point I found myself thinking, gee, wait, wait, who is this? Which oftentimes I do with audiobooks. So I, I really had just a joyful time reading this book. I uh, read and listened. I thought the voice acting of the person narrating on the audiobook was fantastic. 
in the the parts of the book in which we go back to when she's in the orphanage, she speaks in uh, using a Sri Lankan accent. And then during other parts that are like the current time, sometimes that Sri Lankan accent will creep in and sometimes it will creep back. So there was really a lot of interesting play with that in the audiobook. Um, I think my favorite part of reading this book was um, Paloma's crappy attitude. Um, sometimes I can feel like I wanna just, you know, frick the world. And she was constantly on frick the world. And I was like, uh, I'm vibing with this energy, even though she, she does a handful of terrible things. Um, so yeah. Yeah, well, I, I had to laugh at her self-talk and because I'm like, damn, I, I think the same thing, you know, some of what she would say, I mean, you know, just not to that extent, you know, but just occasionally it might come up, but um, it, yeah, and her unreliability just made it more fascinating. And then whatever this big secret was, I, I definitely, you know, wanted to keep reading it. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I'd like to, I'll look forward to hear what other people say about it. Yeah, I definitely felt um, Paloma, like at sometimes she was difficult to read because you were like, oh, you're, you are just, but she also just kept me turning pages. And um, and like, sometimes I have this line underlined here where she says, if constipation were a person, this is what they would look like. And it's just like, <laughs> there are some lines in there where I just like laughed out loud at her attitude. Um, but she definitely, it's really interesting to read a book with a questionable character as far as like her likability and certainly her reliability, um, but have her be such a strong character and have her be so compelling and part of this story that you really want to follow. I did one of the, it was in an interview, either written or um, at like a podcast interview where the author was saying that she like had had a thought at a, at a line in a bank one time about like being frustrated. And I think she kind of like channeled that was like, what if I just took that and made a person out of it? And so it's like, you kind of see that complete, just, you know, no filter and um, just saying whatever angry thoughts pop up in your head. So. Yeah, so I read this book last year and um, was actually, I made a mistake of reading it at night and like getting hooked at it in the middle of the night. Um, and I normally can like shut off, put a book down, go to bed. Uh, I stayed up until 1 a.m. finishing it and then stayed up like another 30, 45 minutes like processing it and kind of being freaked out, um, which very rarely happens to me because I'm like, Emily, I don't like thrillers. Um, and so I... Uh, that was the impetus for choosing it for this month and then I'm rereading it now um uh, alongside everybody else and when I'm with the reread the knowing what happens at the end picking up on the themes beforehand it's still a really fun read and I get to dig into it a little bit deeper and that's um a really fun way I think of writing this type of unreliable narrator uh structure and just to let people know who are watching this, we will definitely be, from now on, I think we'll be, after Fatima shares her reaction, um, we'll have some spoilers. So I think we've done a good job of laying the, the groundwork, but to have a good book club, we need to have some spoilers really revealed. So Fatima. I think um, the unreliable narrator really helped me stay engaged with the story. Um, I was constantly trying to figure out what was real, same as, Paloma was um, and trying to figure out where the connections was and trying to guess like what the outcome would be so I think that for me is like the fun of a thriller is trying to see if I can get ahead of it um, and uh, in this one I was able to guess some things but a lot of things I actually wasn't able to guess and the ending was just like I I was not I wasn't sure how to feel about that. I texted Sheila afterwards and I was like, wait, is this what happened? I don't know how I feel about this. So it was um I, I appreciated the unreliable narr narrator a lot. And I think it's difficult to write that um 
as a writer because you have to figure out how to do it realistically that someone isn't really trustworthy in this scenario. Yeah. Um, and since we're talking about that, you know, um, I think that uh, we noticed that Paloma dissociates throughout the novel and uh, how does, how did the unreliable narrator impact the rest of your reading experiences? I think as, again, someone who has read a lot of thrillers, I find myself always trying to guess the twists. And by having that unreliable narrator, um, it just kept me a little more on my toes with that because it's not just, am I taking the pieces of information that are given to me and putting the puzzle together, but also can, can we trust what she said? Um, and I think that the author handled it really well. Like I found myself, I kept, I did guess the main twist pretty early on. But I kept questioning myself and being like, wait, but maybe that's not it. Maybe actually this is. And how, like, that's the ideal reading experience where you can feel at the end the validation of being like, I was right. But then it didn't feel like you were just then dragging along the story. Um, and I think a big piece of that was like, what, what do we trust from Paloma? I mean, Paloma even questions herself, you know, and I think that that's like, She's like, wait, I'm right, right, aren't I? And and I think that's a really interesting way to um to present that unreliable narrator too, because it's just that self doubt just like gives it a whole other layer. And I thought there were some great nuances too with the um the like the dis disassociative piece and the unreliable narrator, like really little things. Like she'd be like, I love green smoothies now. I gotta go get this green juice. You know, she's like, I just, I love it. And then like two pages later, she's like chucking it because she's like, I hate this, it's disgusting. And you're like, okay, whoa, you are, this is just, you know, little things like that, um, that kind of ran throughout the book, I thought really just helped add so many layers to all the ways that she was both unreliable and also like disassociating and being basically, you know, different people. that part in particular really like made me think about what she actually thought about right about all the people in her life whether her roommate was actually a decent person whether her parents were good people you know whether um the guy that she was going out on dates with was a decent person as well it's just like so many different it, it, you questioned every single observation that she had because they were all kind of twisted and unraveled based on our mood and that was really um, interesting and powerful I thought. So Emily you did you really guess the uh, predict what the the ending you know the the plot not all of the details but to all right here comes the main spoiler I did realize that the girls were switched pretty early on. You did okay okay especially because they kept making such a big deal about her chipped tooth and they did it often enough. I was like, this is going to be, you, you've mentioned it now four times. It's going to be important that her tooth is chipped and then kind of went from there. But then I kept doubting myself. There was one ridiculous point where I was like, is she dead? Is Are, are there ghosts? Is that where this is, is going? And then clearly went in a different direction, but that was really fun. <laughs> Yeah, so there was a lot to unpack with the end. Like I'm just remembering now. So the well, the fire and the the wife of the caretaker that was living behind the walls. Like what what was that about? I don't know. It just I think it all sort of coalesced uh, to a now. You know, as I'm as I'm putting it into words, I'm like that that was kind of wild. Th that makes me think of something that Lucy had said to me. Cause I read this book and I was like, I need to start yapping. Um, and like the whole woman living in the walls kind of like hidden away type thing. That is something that would happen in the 19th century novels that those girls love so much. That's some Jane Austen type stuff. So I was like, Lucy said it, I, I stole your cool thing and said it. But <laughs> it was Jane, yeah, it was, it was Jane, it was Jane Eyre directly yeah. that made me think about it. like, you know, the, the mad wife in the attic. But um yeah, it's an interesting like connection between the books that they love to read and then the actual plot. 
direct ties to Wuthering Heights. I'll admit that that was a book I was supposed to read in high school and didn't. Mm -hmm. um, did it, but th that was another thing that kept coming up. So I feel mm -hmm. sure that there must have been ties. It was like particularly the reinvention piece of it, like completely becoming somebody else and entering into a new space in that way and, and the revenge plot. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I would also say the unlikable <laughs> characters. Like I read Wuthering Heights as a teenager, I think, and I was like, I love it. It's so romantic. And then I reread it as an adult. And I was like, these people are horrible. Um, they're despicable. And, and I'm not saying that Paloma is despicable, but like, it just, you know, I kept thinking like, well, here's a similarity. And I don't think that, you know, the woman in the attic or the woman behind the walls, like, even though it feels like a 19th century trope, trope to us, uh, it's actually really relevant culturally for a society, it, you know, like in Sri Lanka, the mental health is still very stigmatized and mental, um, like, it, it, the, the reason that they used was that he didn't want to experience the shame of having a wife who was admitted into a mental hospital. And so he didn't give get the care necessary for her. He, he decided to hide her away instead. Um, and I think that that's actually unfortunately really common because people are so worried about what other people will think of them and the loss of reputation that would come about because of it. Wow. Well, I appreciate you pointing that out because that's, it. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I really wish that Mohini was actually a ghost. I was oh, like, really? how about, that's a, that'd be a really interesting vein to follow. That's I was okay. like, please just be a ghost. <laughs> What'd you say? I had the exact opposite. I was so relieved when it was not a ghost because I prefer I prefer the evils of the real world. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But go ahead, I interrupted you. That's all I was saying. <laughs> I just finished a book that had a um a character in it that was that was actually a ghost, but it was La Lorena, which is like the same thing. It's the same woman just um in, you know, a, in this Hispanic culture um, and it's sort of interesting to me. I think one of your questions to, or talked about that, the, um, the idea that like this, this goes to sort of a, um, like a warning to kids almost, you know, a cautionary tale that, that she exists in a lot of cultures. So I, I, I wondered like, is she really a ghost or is she real as a person? Yeah, I was just saying that there's um, another version of this in at least North India. Um, which has, I don't remember the context of where this came up in conversation, but it's also used as a way to scare children. And it's uh, in like the few ghost story movies that are in Hindi language cinema, it's like she's the, the uh, cultural touch point. And so when reading this and hear, reading about Mohini, which um, granted, I, I lived in Sri Lanka for a year, it's not a long time, it's not enough time to really dig into the folklore or the, the stuff that children are raised with. But I'm curious, uh, I, and I should have researched this beforehand, but like, is Mohini like a real thing who use like Southern Sri Lankan myth, or is it something that she made up for story because it ties in so well with how other cultures see um, scary women and, and like witches and ghosts? Actually, I think basic, oh, go ahead. No, it's okay, go ahead. I did some very basic Wikipedia searching about, I don't know, 10 minutes before we started. Um, and on the disambiguation page, there was nothing about um, the Sri Lankan ghost, but that could be a, a gap in Wikipedia rather than um, mm -hmm. being made up for the book because that's as far as my Literally, research. the first Google search for Mohini Sri Lankan ghost is an article written by Amanda Jayatissa. <laughs> <laughs> that should be a worthy read um actually for me like one of the most terrifying things about the mohilini was um the the hair falling over the the braid falling over the edge of the bed and uh, like always pulling that back in like to me that thing is more terrifying than something coming out from under your bed 
And so I, I felt that very deeply. And I think I yelped when it actually happened um, in the book. I was like, mm, I knew that was going to come back. And it did. <laughs> it's quite terrifying. Who are the women in white references in like, I don't know, is that is that something that comes up in American folk tales or no, cultural norms? to warn children I don't I don't know I mean I think there's a book called the woman in white by Wilkie Collins which would you know be that same um like 19th century but and I think it's you know about a and I'm not really sure but like this ghostly woman but I don't know if she serves the same purpose it's not um oh yeah I see Bloody Mary from Sheila there <laughs> mm. um <clears throat> yeah I, I do think there's that like scary woman like why you know what is it about women that is so terrifying and specifically women in mourning these characters are, are mourning the, the death of their children or or there's a weeping there's it's always mourning women that are terrifying I'm like huh Mm -hmm. yeah, you're, right. you're right that's so often what they what happens and yeah and yeah just in movie plots too I'm just thinking of uh different aspects of that <clears throat> one of the things the, this had come to my mind when I was finished with the book I was thinking you know what does it mean like is it about colonialism or what is this bigger you know was there a bigger theme here that I that I didn't understand um but then when I read about the how she conjured up this character from being frustrated in the bank line I was like that's okay it's probably just it's just a story a wild story but pretty yeah pretty fascinating okay so I do want to make sure the original Paloma killed the fake one and then went to the bar and came out to and found the guy that's why he didn't recognize her because she was so and it was like a whole new person to him because she was a whole new person I love how heavenly yeah. implied that was like I it was so satisfying that we had to make that leap I, I thought a lot you know many thrillers feel like they were written to be movies and this one it wouldn't work as well I don't think because part of the it's you have to trust whatever your source material is, uh, that what you're seeing is right and who the, the people are. And I think that she, she picked the right format to tell her story. That being said, has it done well enough? Has someone picked it up to make a movie out of it? I wouldn't be surprised, not yet. I was gonna say, I could, I could see it as, I could picture Paloma as a character and her, yeah, and just some of the, you know, the mystery of the, the roommate. Um, yeah. And then, but all that other stuff, I, I feel like in a film, you would might have to trim some of it. And if you're going to stick with the, the real plot, then maybe the roommate part isn't even going to be part of it. I don't, I don't know. Cause there was the neighbor, you know, there was just so much going on. And then her just, I think I'll just go to their house and you know just some of the things that she would do I, I just I just had to laugh just very it unreliable was, yeah interesting to see her character too because we saw her when in, in the stage of her life as a child when she had so little and then the stage of her life as an adult who for the past several years has had so much and it was a really interesting combination of thinking of the character as you know poor girl and rich girl she was it was she was more developed I think than a lot than you might initially think which kept it interesting um I wanted to react to something that Beth said about um is there something more to the story that she didn't quite grasp and when in reality it was just the story and that's what I really liked about this book is uh the author is still often, still often American, like has lived here, lived in the UK, um, but didn't feel the need to have to explain any bigger, like, internal reality of like Sri Lankan existence. He was like, I can write a crazy thriller 
that has Sri Lankan characters that is rooted in Sri Lankan myth and Sinhalese culture without having to make it something bigger than it is. And that's a luxury that is not afforded to too many um, non-white authors uh, for a mainstream audience. And um, I recently listened to Your Invited, which is her second book. And that one's set in Sri Lanka, um, but the main character is, has lived in the U.S. for a long time. Um, so again, like straddles that the fluidity of what is culture, and especially across the West and East. Um, and I guess it was like the same thing. It was rooted in uh, Sinhalese culture, but they didn't have to like over explain anything. There was no conversation around British imperialism, um, no conversation of the Civil War in either book, really. Um, and that is really rare for a book that's set on the island or has references to the island. Um, so Beth, I like that you picked that up and also question like, is there something I'm missing? And I think when it comes to genre writing, horror, thriller, science fiction, people of color are not afforded, like you said, Sheila, an opportunity just to express themselves in genre writing. Um, so it was really, especially when there are so many thrillers centered around white women, I was like, oh, this is nice. Um, I will say that I did learn quite a bit about the experience of somebody who was adopted by a couple of a different race, namely white people adopting children of color. I thought, I thought that was a really interesting viewpoint into an experience I had never considered until reading this book. But also she was just writing, she was just writing a raucous thriller. What fun. Yeah, to your point about um, her adoption and her parents, I did think that that was a really um, interesting way to like include some of the microaggression to experience, but even more than that, like that she was bullied in her school, but her adoptive mother was just, you know, like the, the need for Paloma to assimilate so quickly and the things she would say to her, like, nobody can understand you when you shake your head like that, or like just completely um, casting aside anything that that was something from Sri Lankan culture that you know, like just to erase it that that erasure was um, it was really interesting to me and and how that was done and I think that it um, as a, like building a character I think that all of that story with her parents did a really good job to show you some of why Paloma might be so bitter and angry you know. Um, and so I thought that piece was was really well done. Like it was just in there throughout, but it wasn't um, it wasn't explained to us particularly in a bigger in a bigger way. Which is so nice um, to to take an issue away from a book without it being an issue book, um, because I don't think it's just coincidence that I have like started seeing more and thinking more about uh, transracial adoption. Uh, since I read this book, what, a month ago, two months ago, um, I've been stumbling across articles about it more often, talking about it with friends, and some of it may just be coincidence timing, but I feel like it, because it had time to ruminate in my brain at a time when I didn't feel like I was trying to broaden my mind and better myself, it also gave it a little bit more time to, to settle and it, I want to go out and read more and keep talking about this because it's something that a lot of people are uh, facing and dealing with that I don't think a lot of us have thought about at all, which is kind of awful. I, I really, really appreciated the transracial adoptee storyline. Um, and <clears throat> I think that you're right, uh, Emily, that there's a lot more in the news about it. I think it's been showing up. The The conversation has really shifted in the last few years about transracial adoptees, especially um, with like genetic testing uh, as well. Like, so people finding siblings who had also been adopted. Um, I actually had a friend who found two of their sisters uh, through genetic testing, which I think was just incredible. Um, 
and uh, also because they are really trying to find out um, the legality of what happened, right? Why happened? Because a lot of adopted folks may not have actually been orphaned. Um, and so, so there's like a business behind it and, and, um, and lots of details around that. What I appreciated was how um, this book kind of talked about the microaggressions that can happen without even like intention or effort. I don't think that Paloma's mother uh, had negative or ill will towards her. She wanted her daughter to fit in. She wanted her daughter to have a social life, to have a party and to celebrate after the spelling bee or whatever the case may be. And uh, uh, without really realizing how difficult uh, she was being. So even something like the coconut oil, not record, you know, at one point we learned that, um, you know, if you don't use coconut oil, I think your hair is going to fall out or something like that. Like there's a, there's a mythology or a belief system around it. And um, she makes no effort to understand why do you do this, right? Why are you putting coconut? Why was this such an important object for you to bring with you all the way from Sri Lanka um, like there, there's no effort to understand that there's no curiosity there around it there's this automatic assumption that what we do and how we do it is correct and I think that's the root of microaggressions is is this assumption so I, I appreciated that she didn't preach at us but she really very vividly demonstrated how these things can happen um, and happen so frequently. Like I was exhausted by it. I was so exhausted by reading microaggression after microaggression. I did um, this book, Emily Wood, and you were saying got you thinking about uh, adoption. I did like look up a little bit about adoption specifically from Sri Lanka, and I think it looks like it seems like there, um, in I think in the nineteen eighties there were something like they think like eleven thousand um, Sri Lankan adoptees that were usually bought or sometimes stolen, um, and so I think that's like what you're saying too, Fatima, about people finding siblings and um, the legality around it. And then I read about baby farms, which were actually um, created for like places to, for women to get pregnant and essentially produce babies. So it was really eye-opening and it's, and it's like, Emily, how you're saying it wasn't a book that you were expecting to jump into and, and I don't know, like not learn a lot, but, but so then it's interesting. Like, I liked that I was compelled to do this extra piece of, of research beyond it to, you know, see more about that. Not to take this on a really uh, tragic uh, tangent, but the uh, there's a podcast called um, I, I can't remember the name of it. So I'm just going to say it, but it's by Gimlet, and it's um, about Indigenous people's uh, legal issues. And so this recent season was about the um, Indian Child Welfare Act, which is a law from the 1970s that keeps uh, Indigenous children with their families um, in the case that their parents can no longer care for them. And there is a push through, through like very conservative channels to the Supreme Court to overturn it was um, as a way to provide uh, white families specifically with equal footing um, in adoption cases uh, alongside indigenous families. And this is like a very real example of how this manifests in the United States. And um, the whole, like the conversations that come out post jobs about uh, or the Dobbs in court ruling, like what it means to have um, transracial adoptees in the country or internationally, and who gets to decide how they like are entitled to another child or to a child's uh, body or their affection. Um, and I didn't put those pieces together until just now, like how uh, we see the trauma of one story of transracial adoptees adoption, but like it's so much bigger than that and we see it it's, it's just not you're right Emily it's not talked about and it's 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 everywhere it's everywhere did you all 
all find yourselves rooting for Paloma? Who were you cheering for when you were reading this book? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to know what was going on and I I didn't want her to get hurt. So, you know, I'd say I was rooting for her. I, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to keep her safe and get to the bottom of the story. So it was more selfish reasons. What about you guys? Even though he was, um, I guess maybe the word is smarmy, just the littlest bit, I was rooting for the, not Aaron, the Sri Lankan man she meets on the street and, and they kind of date a little bit. Sam. Sam. There was a part of me in a small part, I was like, Sam, I, I hope things work out for you. He was probably the most likable character. <laughs> that was sense. part of me also cheering for Paloma too in some sick, weird way. It's, it's complicated. Well, you saw how complicated Paloma's life was. So yeah. even though, you know, if you saw her on the street, you might not want to go spend a lot of time with her. When you get the perspective of what she has both dealt with in her past and what she's dealing with every day, I think it gave me more patience with her as a character that I did want to see things turn out, even if turning out maybe wouldn't be what she was actually hoping for. Her version of her things turning out was probably not my version of things turning out for her. I think I was rooting for the adults Paloma because at the end of it is like what happened happened to them as children and they were not in control of it really they were pressured into it um and I think that what their fate would have been had they not been adopted was very clear um and made clear and kind of terrifying and I think it's okay like it's a very human thing to want to escape that so um so I was rooting for the adult Paloma and I was I was uh kind of really sad to <laughs> at how the ending kind of it was like okay well that's that then <laughs> maybe Sam and her meet in the afterlife I don't know This is another thing that I just pieced together. Um, I just, I clearly have a good way of uh, bifurcating within a story from reality, but um, even like foster care systems, if we read enough about how the foster care system completely fails the children that are placed in them and what their outcomes look like after 18. And Fatima, like you just mentioned, like they knew what was going to happen if at the age of 15 when they went to the girl, the woman's home, and then what would happen afterwards. And, um, Again, we see that here day in, day out, and stories aren't written about them. There aren't, there's people with power are not changing systems to make it safer or have, lead to healthier outcomes. Um, wow, this book is a lot more like powerful than just a thriller, really showing like the, the horrors of the everyday and of what it seems to be the mundane. I was also thinking a lot about the children who'd been separated at the borders and then, uh, you know, the children who we still to this day, like, have, don't know exactly where they are or what homes they've been placed in, um, if they've been placed in a home. And like, that's something that continues to haunt me um, and thinking, of, you know, like, and in that that situation, it wasn't necessarily that the parents were bad parents or these children were orphans or anything like that. They were separated from their parents for the like the very simple violation of crossing a border and and I think that 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 that's also like an even greater tragedy so I I was thinking a lot about that when I was reading this book and what experiences these those kids might be having because they didn't even want to be adopted probably or fostered. Sometimes after I'd read it, uh, I would, I would just like really appreciate my my home, my bed, my room, my life. You know, I mean, and just like thinking about a child, kids, orphan kids, and you know, it's just really, it's really sad. And there's not just orphan kids, but neglected kids here in this 
in our community. Uh, you know, all those things just, I always just start, you know, sort of place myself in, in other situations. Um, and um, yeah, I guess I just felt really lucky and luck and, you know, glad that I had my kids and they've grown up and anyway, it just, um, but, but yeah, talking about all these other aspects of it, it's definitely like to call it a thriller is not, it doesn't do it justice because there are so many other layers to it. It's, you know, so many of those are formulaic and this was not. So I will say, um, having read her second book, um, it seems like two out of two that um, Amanda uh, Deatrice has an interesting writing structure of like eighty percent of the book is leaves you in the dark of what's going to happen, what has happened, um, who is reliable, and then the last twenty percent you see this huge spike in action, like the writing the. Uh, uh, exposition takes 80 percent the rising action is the next 10 percent and then it's a quick climax and then 10 percent of resolution and that um again as a thriller I, and I don't read a lot of thrillers um it's a really interesting style to build up that suspense as opposed to a really steady climb of suspense instead it, um there's a lot of beating around the bush with the unreliability of in this case one narrator in her second book many narrators and um, we are actually talking, Fatima and I are talking to her tomorrow. And I'm curious to learn a little bit more about this active choice of narration. I'm so relieved to hear that her second book is good uh, because when I read that this was her debut novel, um, sometimes when I read a really good debut, I get a little nervous because there have been times in the past where you know someone tells their one big story and they reach their success and then they have a year or two years to come up with their next thing. And it just doesn't reach that point. And I was kind of, I, I, I put, put it on hold, but I was a little nervous to get it. So it's nice to hear from someone who enjoyed this, that it, it's also worth reading. So I'm curious, uh, sorry, haha, <laughs> cold. Um, <laughs> so I'm curious uh, about um, the theme of desperation in, in this book. Uh, we see a lot of different types of it um, and whether you were able to identify specific types of desperation and, or if there was any moments where you felt like you could really lean into it or relate to it. Um, for me, I think the 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 desperation that uh, I the moment for her where she was at the in the very beginning where she's at the bank and she's really trying to get through and kind of go through the loopholes and um and and try to find it. Like for me, that was so relatable. I've I've been um. I've been trying to navigate systems that are set up so that to protect us as individuals, right? Like I'm not gonna give you my banking information and stuff like that, but I've been navigating that with my dad um, since he's had Alzheimer's and just trying to like shift things so that I have access to stuff and whatnot. And let me tell you, like, it is so exhausting. And there have been definitely moments where I've just felt like complete and utter, like, just, can you just help me here? Like, don't tell me I need to go and do 10 other things and fill out 10 other forms in order to do this one tiny thing. Like, just help me out here. Um, and I'm glad that they don't, you know, in the bigger picture, in my sane mind, I'm like, I'm glad that these securities exist, but I'm still, but but while she was standing there and thinking that I was like this is so relatable um very very real and if anyone else felt that way in other parts of the book um <clears throat> just thinking about what you said Fatima um the whole banking thing just and with with your dad being ill it's I I know it's got to be really challenging um 
and frustrating. Um, but the, per the person I didn't relate to, but now, and I couldn't find her name, the little girl that would carry around the doll. She was desperate. Monica. Yeah. They had really cute names, pretty names too. But yeah, she was so desperate and tortured. And, and then, you know, then she, uh, so it was the original one, the young uh, Paloma that destroyed the doll and just, yeah, she she was a she was a little nasty thing, but I mean, heck, what kind of life did she have? But she she was, yeah, I can't even imagine. She was desperate too, and I yeah, think that you know, I, all the characters dealt with that, and so I think that made it that even though I wouldn't describe many of the characters as particularly likable, I still wanted them to to succeed and. I, I think it is because even if my moments of feeling desperate don't exactly align with theirs, that's such a human emotion that you can put yourself with how they're feeling, even if you have never experienced any kind of trauma like they have. Yeah. Yeah. If you have empathy, which I think we all probably do. Um and yeah. reading helps build that. That's, you know, I, I find that you talk to readers and that's that's how you learn about worlds outside of your own. And because especially as kids, when you're reading those books written in first person of someone who is having a life experience that's so different from yours, uh, you are having their experience, but it's opening your mind to what that could potentially feel like. It's so important. Um, and Sorry, sorry to get on my kid lit soapbox here. But <laughs> no, it's, I mean, yeah, I, just yeah, as, as a reader, and you know, thinking about when I the things I would read as a kid, it really you know really did open up my mind. I loved reading uh, biographies and and learning about different cultures, and um, so I think everyone should. And what's this business about banning books? <sighs> Anyway, um, I'll, I'll mute. I mean, it's definitely a really important conversation to have, especially because we're speaking with a library system. Um, and hopefully Ann Arbor doesn't feel the same type of ire that other systems are now dealing with. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the orphanage as a, a central plot and location in the book. Um, I had the opportunity when I was living in Colombo to um, volunteer for Christmas um, at an orphanage north of Colombo. And so this orphanage is um, located like not even 10 kilometers south of Colombo. And so I, I was north of Colombo, went to this orphanage run by nuns. Uh, so similar, a similar uh, situation. But in that case, um, and this was in 2012, 2013, 20, end of 2012. So 10 years after this book is set in, in uh, Ratnapura, uh, Ratnapura. And it just felt like worlds apart in how the kids were treated and how visitors were treated, where none of the kids were expected to put on a show and po or a, a horse and pony show that we were um, there to engage with the children. And um, we weren't there to be entertained. And, um, so Fatima and I were talking about this a little earlier that the kids in this in, the, in this novel all understand the Western canon, but like don't understand what's happening in their own country. And so when I Google mapped the location of this of this orphanage, I realized it was like 10 kilometers south of the capital. I was like, wait, what? How do they not know anything about what's happening in their own country beyond cricket? When in 20 in 2002, there's still a civil war happening. There's still violence all around them. Um, and yet, like, they're focused on British literature or Indian Hindi cinema um, and aren't exposed to anything else about them. One, <clears throat> pardon me, one of the things that came to mind, and I, I didn't research it, so maybe we could Google it now, but um, whether or not the orphan is a trope itself, is there, or like, is there, are there orphan, um, horror movies or is it, is it like sometimes there are people that are adopted are you know problematic and ha have some kind of 
orphans as the origin story yes yeah yeah <laughs> well yeah 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 but right yeah and it could go in both directions right like batman mm -hmm. is a hero but there are other people who are not yep yeah so i also think about oh sorry uh, orphans no, in um children's literature are so highly featured but it's it's a, it's an interesting trope there because it's like they they usually are adopted or they live with someone who is not kind to them but then it's also interesting to see so many orphaned children in um children's books as like uh, it's almost like was this some it's not it's not a fantasy but like you know what would it be like to escape your family and it's just an interesting way that it's presented in children's literature you kind of get both parts of it like yeah it's fun and also like oh i'm now with these horrible people but that's the adventure and so it's it's um interesting to think about it there it's 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 very different from this kind of story or horror or um adult stories but it is like so widely featured in I children's wonder... literature how much of it in children's literature is almost like you just need to get rid of the parents so that the kid can go on the adventure and you aren't like how did how did they get away with this because the yeah. only grown-ups in their life neglect them so they can go off and right. do what they need to but it totally romanticizes it yeah <clears throat> um when my kids were really young and they were they would play house i remember them saying they <laughs> let's pretend like our parents are dead and basically they would they played this you know but I guess that's that's part of the fantasy right of like we we have to survive we're on our own and but I'm um, going off on a tangent but one of the one of the play ways they would play is my daughter she would have been about six uh would um I would be the social worker to do an assessment and make sure she was capable of being the caregiver for her younger brother. I mean, that's that's how she had me in this role playing anyway. Um, so yeah, I guess that's kind of a way kids play, right? I mean, you would, yeah, you often, we don't have parents. <laughs> So we're coming up on the top of the hour and I just wanted to see if there's anything that you wanted to touch on that we weren't able to um, about this book or any other thoughts or feelings that came up while reading it. Uh, yes, one of the big things, like Emily, I love thrillers, particularly domestic thrillers or thrillers. I find myself gravitating towards thrillers where women are the characters. I don't really read many books about men. Um, but there is definitely a very trendy, popular trope in women-driven thrillers where the main character is drunk enough to not remember the thing they need to remember, but, but sober enough to solve the mystery. And I feel like that's a really unfair, um, unrealistic depiction of alcoholism. And I've seen it in, I can think of three or four books at the top of my head where it's just a plot point. She's drunk, she's drunk because if she wasn't drunk, there would have been no mystery. Yeah. And I would be really interested to read a book where perhaps it was the other way, where the one time she wasn't drunk, she saw the murder and she has to, she then spends the rest of the book drunkenly trying to solve the murder. Because I think that's probably more realistic than whether it's the woman in the window, the girl on the train, sometimes I lie. It's like, we got to stop using it as just a plot point because it's a real thing for real people that happen to people. And it's not like that. So let yeah, me step Jacob, down oh, from no, my soapbox. You, you, Jacob, you and I talked briefly about even like the idea of blacking out. Um, using that as this um, device is that like when you when you black out you don't your brain is not actually creating any memories at all so um and they didn't she didn't do that in this book like like there weren't pieces that came back to her i feel like when she had blacked out so i i do feel like the, that blackout piece was addressed correctly but i i hear what you're saying it is very much um 
featured as sort of a way to move the plot forward in a lot of yeah. books. Yeah, the flight attendant too is like that, right? <laughs> There's a lot, yeah. Yeah, but the, the girl on the train and I don't know, a bunch of them, but you're right, it does move it. One other person that, the character that I didn't like was the um, the the driver, the, oh. the sexual predator driver guy. So he was desperate. <clears throat> he might be the one desperate character I didn't feel any empathy towards. No. Yeah. You know, because of the detail, she's so she's very good at details, the author. Um, and one of the details she shared about the driver was like the his uncle would put out cigarettes on his arms. And then when Sam had those same scars for a while, I was like, please don't let that be the same guy. Please don't let that be the same guy. I was like, that was a mantra until we reached it. Cause in my head I was just like, because that would be so twisted and I wouldn't want to. I mean, I, so that was something I was definitely hoping with it. Yeah. What, one more little detail. I know we are Oh, you're but, fine. Um, her, her, par the, her parents, the reality of her parents, and then this book made me sad. And I mean, it, like that, especially with the postcard thing and the, um, I mean, that's like a little bit of a desperation too, when you re realize the reality, right? Like, maybe this situation is going to fix itself. You know, they, they're still sending me postcards. Wait, how do they know I'm here? And then you realize what they're, that they're, they're not. And um, it's just, I thought that part was very sad. And I did not see that coming personally at all. Same here, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> That's all. I, yeah, I didn't see it coming. And then I also wondered when, um, she used the past tense in describing the neighbor relationship to the neighbor. And I was like, did I miss something? Did the neighbor die? Like, I didn't think her parents died, but the way she was, she's like, oh yeah, my parents were friends with, mm -hmm. and when, when she met the neighbor across the street, I was like, oh, that's weird. But yeah, little hints here and there. It's, it's very satisfying <laughs> to figure it out at the end. <laughs> so what we're saying yeah, is like, don't we don't this book. Yeah, don't. Deeply, yeah. And it's still quite a fast read. I read it in the span of a weekend. So very enjoyable. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for engaging in such an awesome conversation. Um, for Spooky Susan, highly, highly recommend this book and also her second book, You're Invited. Um, and just a big thank you to the Ann Arbor Sister Library for hosting us and engaging in such a great conversation. Yeah. Next month, we're reading Sharks in the Time of Saviors. It's a uh, f it's a novel fiction about um, a Hawaiian family saga. I think so. It should be very cool. And thank you, as always, Sheila and Fatima, for leading us in this discussion. And for, I mean, we say it every time, but for putting a <laughs> book in our hands that we might not have um, picked up otherwise. So. It's very appreciated. Bye, folks. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Bye.